Hello, I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Holman and Adrian Ravenscroft, who will, be, who will take you through this session called Think Globally and Act Locally, developing a personal, local and global perspective is an essential part of Cambridge Global Perspectives. This session explores ways in which you can work with your learners to explore and connect the local and the global as part of a Cambridge Global Perspectives course or within the wider primary curriculum. Tom is a former teacher and trainer. He now works as a consultant assessment specialist and Adrian is a tutor for qualifying teachers. He has taught both primary and secondary. Before we start, I just wanted to go through a few points with you. You may have noticed your microphones are muted. They will stay on mute as we go through the session to avoid any background noise. We are also hosting this webinar from home. So if there are any issues with our internet connections, please bear with us. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So do post any questions you'd like to see answered in the, as we go through. You can also use the chat box for any general comments, but please don't post questions for Tom and Adrian here as they may get lost. If you're having any technical difficulties with sound or video, please let us know in the chat and we'll do our best to resolve them. We recommend you use headphones to listen to this session for the best sound quality. We are recording the webinar and we'll send you a link to the playlist following the conference. So don't worry if you do miss anything. If you're unable to see the Q&A or chat icons, please hover your mouth at the bottom or on the top of the screen and they should appear. And now over to Tom and Adrian. Thank you, Janie. Thinking globally, and acting locally is an approach advocated most notably by environmental activists. For our presentation, we will consider some of the interesting possibilities that these current ideas present for us as educators. It is widely accepted that our world is shaped by forces that are global in scope, but the local impacts of these, be they economic, social, cultural, or environmental are felt by our children in different ways. If our job is to work with our children to create understanding of the world and the forces shaping it, where do we begin? What should our perspective be? What skills and attributes will be prized in the adult world in which our students will spend their working lives? Can there be a place for global concepts such as peace, international solidarity and justice in an already crowded school curriculum? If what children learn now has a place to play in bringing about positive change, what are the pedagogical approaches that can underpin effective practice? In attempting to answer these questions, we will begin by setting out some underlying principles. We will then give examples of classroom activities that can be used flexibly across the primary age phase. The activities have been developed in the context of the Cambridge Primary Global Perspectives curriculum, but could equally serve other areas of a broad primary curriculum. We will outline an approach for conducting investigations considering the role of first-hand experience, secondary research, and the key importance of learners undertaking action as part of their learning, as well as opportunities for them to reflect on the results of their actions. We will then suggest ways in which this approach can be applied to an investigation beyond the classroom in order for pupils to consider their local area with a critical perspective. Finally, we will draw some conclusions on the implications of teaching with a global perspective and the role of both teachers and learners in building understanding. And we look forward to your questions in response. Let's start with these underlying principles. Number one, together with our children, we exist in a world that is tangible. We agree with our mathematics colleagues that engagement with the concrete is necessary for successful theorising in the abstract. Making sense of this tangible world is a process and that requires both action and reflection. This process is basic to our humanity. Principle number two. 
This world is not static. On the contrary, change is a constant. Our job is to work with our students to develop understanding of the world has come to be as it is, as well as how things will be different in future. Not only is change possible, it is inevitable. The enemy of understanding is a fatalistic mindset in the face of such change. Students need practical experience of bringing change about and the opportunity to reflect on these experiences. Principle number three, for, the per for our purposes, the school, its location and the community the school serves are not only legitimate objects of study, but essential focal points for investigation. A meaningful global perspective rests on a sound sense of place. Activities in and beyond the classroom need to enable, to, need to enable children to engage as active citizens within their location, to reflect on its connections and their place in shaping its future. Our task is opening the curriculum to issues that present themselves within that locality as people go about meeting their needs. These universal needs, food, housing, transport, healthcare, education, culture, etc., are all appropriate programme content. The impacts of choices on the built and natural environment should be considered and reconsidered with a critical mindset. What do we preserve? What do we need to change in order to build a fairer, more sustainable future? Finding answers to these questions necessarily impacts on our role as educators. We need to be alert to the issues that present themselves in the community that our school serves in the lived experience of our learners. To help guide critical reflection on the nature of these issues. To help formulate appropriate responses. And above all, this means we must continue being learners ourselves. This first activity is entitled Mapping My Connections. It can be used with children of a variety of ages I will later show you two responses produced by brothers from London, aged six and nine, Ed and Oscar. I first came across an activity of this nature when I worked as a secondary geography teacher, but as we can see, it can be used successfully with children much younger. For all ages, the key inquiry question here is, how am I connected to the world? In this activity, learners use a simple spatial framework to represent their knowledge of the world, focusing on places that are significant to them. The aim is to activate pupils' understanding of links they inevitably have with a wide range of different places. So I'm going to introduce you to four objects from my house. I must emphasise that these are not presented as intrinsically valuable or interesting subjects of inquiry for your learners. They are only of interest here because this is what I use to model how a connections map can work for Ed and Oscar. It would, of course, be far more appropriate for you to model connections of significance to you so that your learners can map connections of significance to them. OK, my first two objects, a delivery bike and a jar of jam, were chosen because their connections at a local scale. The jam made by my friend Val from Fruitchy Grows. She sells it to raise money for a local health care charity. Around once a month, I cycle to her house about a mile from mine with empty jars in a crate on the front and some cash. I, ret I return with full jars and sell the jam to my neighbours. This is my uh, next set of objects, which was hats and wool, which were chosen because of their connections at, at a wider scale. During, Scott, uh, during lockdown, my wife learned how to knit in the round using a fair isle pattern. This is a traditional technique from Scotland.
We live in Birmingham in central England and the wool arrives by post from Shetland. These are islands off the North Scottish coast. Completed hats are already with family members in Belfast and Edinburgh. This is my other bike, which was built during lockdown. This has been chosen to show just how one object can come into being as a result of connections at a much wider scale. Some componentry is made by an Italian company that has, um, has uh, production units in different parts of the European Union. The frame was made in Belgium, the tires by a Germany company, German company. Of course, not much rubber grows in Germany. The company sources its rubber from Thailand and Indonesia. I haven't researched all of the, the components, for example, the bottle, but there's a strong likelihood that at least some of them were made in China. Let's have a look at what our uh, brothers, Ed and Oscar made of this. This is um, Ed, and Ed is six. He says, I've drawn my stick collection. I love finding good sticks in the park and bringing in the best ones home. I like ones which look like a catapult or have unusual colours on them. I've probably got more than 50 sticks in my stick collection. They used to be in a small bucket, but are now in an old large bin. In the next circle, I'll draw my birthday party, which I had during the first lockdown. I wasn't allowed to have people in the house, so I met with a few friends in the park. I was given a new lightsaber by relatives in Germany. It was really nicely wrapped and arrived in a big box. So I asked my friends to bring their lightsabers and we had a Star Wars party. The picture is of all of us playing with our lightsabers. Harrison Ford is in Star Wars and also in Indiana Jones. He's from America. John Williams wrote the music. He's also an, an American. Here's Oscars. Uh, remember Oscar is nine, who says, this is my house and road and school, and I've drawn a stick. This is the object that connects me to my local area. We spent a lot of time at our local park and on the flats during lockdown. We've played a lot of games with sticks, collecting sticks, making dens, finding the best and biggest stick, and even stick fights over the fence with our neighbors. We even have a stick collection. On the next circle, I've drawn my new Arsenal duvet. This was a present from a relative in Germany. They posted it to us for Christmas. I've also played a lot of football in the park and on the flats during lockdown, wearing my Arsenal kit. I guess the Arsenal team includes people from all over the world. In the next circle, I've drawn some books. There's a book with a story about lemurs, which we read a few times during, read, read a few times during lockdown. This was also a present from Larry in Canada. Lemurs come from Madagascar, which is an island with loads of amazing animals and I'd love to visit. I've also drawn my high-low book. I was given this as a present by my parents for doing well in homeschooling. I saw that it was published in New York. I'll hand you over to Tom who will explain our second activity. Thank you, Adrian. Hello, everyone. We're going to look at a classroom activity which has been developed with learners at primary level in mind, particularly those who are following the Cambridge Global Perspectives curriculum. I'll explain briefly the purpose and rationale behind the activity and then take you through it step by step. The activity takes the form of asking learners to complete and discuss a graphic organiser that links three perspectives on an issue, the personal, the local or national, and the global perspective. The activity is intended to be used as a way of getting learners to think about what they already know about a topic from a personal, local, and global perspective. It might be used to help them come up with a research question at the beginning of an, an investigation or later to decide on a course of action. It therefore has links to the skill strands of research and analysis within the Cambridge Global Perspectives curriculum. The activity is structured around the active learning technique of think, pair, share. So it also helps to promote the skills of communication and collaboration, 
by encouraging interaction within groups of teams or teams of learners. As an extension of the activity, learners could be given the opportunity to reflect on the development of their thinking about a topic as a result of taking part in the activity. I'm now going to talk through the activity step by step. We'll imagine that we're starting a new unit of work with a group of learners, possibly one based on one of the Cambridge Global Perspectives challenges. The topic that this new unit of work is based around will have been made clear to the learners. In our case, we're going to be taking the example of a food related topic such as healthy eating. We start by taking a blank sheet of paper one for each learner. At this stage, learners are working individually. This corresponds to the think stage of the active, active learning technique of think, pair, share. Ask learners to draw a smallish circle in the middle of the paper. In this circle, we're going to ask learners to draw something which has personal significance or importance to them, related to the topic. Our topic being food, I've drawn an apple in my circle. I should emphasize here that what I've drawn is not necessarily my favorite food, but it is a food item which is important to me personally. What happens now is that we ask learners to talk to a partner about what they've drawn in the circle, and especially to talk about why they've chosen it. This is the pair stage of the think pair share active learning technique we're using. So for my example, I might take, tell my partner that apples are important to me because I grew up in a part of the country where small scale traditional apple orchards were a familiar feature of the landscape. This represents the personal perspective. We now ask the learners to draw a slightly bigger concentric circle around their first circle. In this circle, we'll ask learners to draw something related to their first object, but with a wider local or national significance. It might refer specifically to the first object they drew or to the topic in general. Here's what I've drawn in my second circle. We'd now ask pairs of learners to form small groups with another pair and to talk about what their drawings represent. This is the beginning of the share stage of think pair share. So in my case, I might tell the group that in our local area, many traditional orchards have been destroyed because the land is needed for housing leading to a reduction of habitats for birds and insects. This represents the local or national perspective. We're now going to ask the learners to draw a third, even bigger concentric circle, and in this circle to draw something that shows a global issue related to what they've drawn in the previous two circles. They'll do this while continuing to work in small groups, so having the opportunity to discuss what they're going to draw. At this point, we could also ask learners to report back to the rest of the class, describing the different perspectives their three circles represent. So in my case, referring to the third circle, I might tell the class that around the world, fruit is being grown more intensively because consumers demand fresh fruit all the year round, produced to a uniform standard and often sold in packaging that is difficult to reuse or recycle. Transporting large quantities of fruit around the world requires heavy use of energy and produces greenhouse gases. This represents the global perspective. To extend this activity, learners could now be asked to think of a local action they could take in response to the, the global issues they've explored, such as supporting local fruit farmers by buying their produce in season or buying from sources that avoid using packaging, such as plastic bags. Alternatively, they could be asked to come up with a question that could be investigated, such as how much of the fruit we eat is produced locally, or simply where does the fruit we eat come from? Remember that there could also be an opportunity for learners to do some reflection at the end of the activity, for example, by considering how their thinking on the topic has changed or developed as a result of engaging in the activity. So to recap briefly, we've just looked at an activity that takes the form of a visual graphic organizer to help learners link personal, local and global perspectives on an issue. The activity is structured around the active learning technique of think, pair, share, and helps to promote communication and collaboration among learners working 
in groups or teams. The activity we've just looked at might take up all or part of a lesson. What's coming next is a more extended type of activity, or more precisely, a framework for a sequence or cycle of activities which could structure a research project, probably over a number of lessons. The title of this section is deliberately ambiguous. Primary research can mean simply research carried out by primary age learners, but it also brings to mind the distinction between primary and secondary research, where primary research refers to actively obtaining data about something, for example, by conducting a survey or carrying out observations, while secondary refers to accessing the findings of other people's research. When working within the framework of the Cambridge Primary Global Perspectives curriculum, teachers may use challenges, short, uh, medium term schemes of work to develop their learners skills. What's presented here offers an alternative approach. The need for this may arise because primary teachers find that the time they can spend on teaching global perspectives is limited by external factors, so that only a limited number of challenges can be taught. It may also answer a need for greater flexibility if it is felt that some challenges are not appropriate to the local context or do not address sufficiently the range of skills a teacher wants to cover. While the cycle of activities presented here is intended to provide a framework for structuring a research project, it also has the additional aim of offering opportunities for teachers and learners to address a wide range of primary global perspectives learning objectives at any primary stage. It should be stressed that this is no more than a framework or scaffold for which teachers and learners can provide the content. Adrian will be sharing an example of how this can be done in the next section of our webinar. In keeping with the theme of this webinar, the framework also has the potential to, de to develop learners thinking on a topic from the personal and local to the global and places emphasis on the types of action that might be taken by learners in their local context. We're now going to go through a proposed primary research cycle step by step. I could have another click there, Adrian, please. And one more. Thank you. Primary research places an emphasis on learners obtaining their own data using techniques such as interviews or questionnaires and taking other people as their sources, such as their classmates, other students and adults at their school, their family, friends and relatives, or members of the local community. It's important to point out that the type of research project envisaged here is based on research undertaken by teams of learners rather than by individuals. At each stage of the cycle, teachers can provide support and guidance, but learners should be encouraged as far as possible to make team decisions about their work, for example, about the question they choose to investigate. The personal, local, global activity presented in the previous section of this webinar could be used as a starting point. This bubble represents the planning stage. What refers to the question the team will investigate? How to the technique they'll use? For example, interviews or questionnaires. Who to the division of tasks within the team? What role each member of the team will play in planning, carrying out and presenting the results of their research? This represents the stage of actually carrying out the research which might be preceded by making predictions about what the team will find. This stage involves the recording of data. This bubble represents outcomes from the research that's been conducted. Click please. The team could present their data to the rest of the class, possibly graphically or in the form of a verbal presentation. This stage could also involve decisions about actions that can be taken by the team as a result of their research. This can be an optional stage. The team might use secondary sources at this stage to compare the, their data with others. This in turn might present an opportunity to evaluate the secondary sources they've accessed or to analyze their own data or that of others, asking questions that look into the causes and or consequences of what the data has shown. Although added to the end of this sequence, 
reflection can and probably should occur at each of the previous stages. Learners can reflect on what they've learned in terms of how their thinking about the issue has been affected by their research and on how their behaviour might change as a result of what they've learned or as a result of their experiences of working as a member of a team. This cycle of activities might precede a second cycle, which builds on the learning from the first cycle, perhaps by refining the research question or developing further the research techniques used by the team. And again, please. OK, this is just showing you some of the learning objectives that could be addressed at different stages of the cycle. And we'll go on. To recap, we've just looked at a framework consisting of a cycle of activities that is proposed as a way of structuring a research project. At the same time, this presents opportunities to address a wide range of primary global perspectives learning objectives. We're now going to hear from Adrian again, with an example of how a specific investigation can be undertaken using this framework. Thank you, Tom. Let's apply the processes Tom has described to an investigation about our local area. We can take as our topic young and old and in our inquiry question, how do young and old people feel about our area as a focus for identifying both what the issues are and different perspectives on them. Any local centre where people are out and about meeting their needs would be an appropriate location for this inquiry. We must hope that pandemic restrictions will be lifted to permit such work to take place. But even when they are, a prior staff visit to complete a risk assessment in line with school policy would be essential. Before the visit takes place, learners need to generate questions both questions to consider for themselves and to ask people on the visit. Preparation work in class is needed to ensure that they have an appropriate range of questions. Some will be needed to establish basic information, like where did you come from today? What is the purpose of your visit? To questions that will give different perspectives, such as what would improve the area for you? What might persuade you to come by public transport? It is a good idea to role play interview techniques in class. During the visit, recording can be done in a variety of forms. Sound recording, note taking, tallying data, photography. Back in class, the information can be used by groups of pupils as a basis for proposing action. The form this action could take depends very much on the issue identified. Secondary research, for example, work with international partner schools could be conducted to look at how things could be done differently. One outcome, one sorry, one example of an outcome could be annotating a map or GPS image, image of the area with changes that they would like to see and presenting their findings as a video or a podcast and sending it to local decision makers. Another example of an action would be pub to publicise and then participate in a community cleanup. The final part of this process is reflection. On the outcomes, how well did we do? What were the results of our action? How well did we consider different people's perspectives? And also on the process itself. How efficiently did we work as a team? What were the challenges? How well did we meet them? How did we make the most of all our team members' work? What challenges presented themselves? How could we meet these challenges better next time? Let us return to the questions that we started with. Can we, as educators, help prepare learners for a more sustainable global society? Remember, we take as our starting point certain premises 
about what it means to be a global citizen, which necessarily impact on the way we teach whatever subject we're teaching at the time. Education can either preserve the current unsustainable order or seek to transform it. Transformation requires learners to both act and reflect. If we take as our starting point that learners are passive receptacles for knowledge, we will fail in our goal of reaching our potential, both as educators and learners. A mindset of passive acceptance and fatalism in the face of change is both a cause and consequence of teaching that restricts itself to the function of transmission. So what place do concepts such as peace, international solidarity and justice have in the school curriculum? Conflict is a consequence of denying others humanity. Effective teaching can be built on the critical understanding of universal human needs and aspirations. By using universal needs and aspirations as our materials and critical analysis and reflection as our tools, then diverse cultural responses to meeting those needs and aspirations can be understood in their proper context. There are opportunities across the curriculum to enhance learners' sense of place, to examine and re-examine their understanding of the world, their place in it, and their perspectives on the changes that are taking place. Solidarity is a consequence of effective teaching. Just outcomes set stem from this very sense of solidarity. It is proposed that a really good way to help learners develop a sense of solidarity is to encourage them to take positive action together with their peers in their local environment. The world as it is experienced by our learners is not only a legitimate object of study, it has in fact formed the core of the very best primary practice and always has done. Does this mean that our curriculum necessarily becomes parochial as a consequence? Quite the reverse is true. In empowering our learners and ourselves to look critically at the forces at work in our own context, we also become empowered to engage in meaningful comparative analysis. We also become equipped to exercise empathy with perspectives that grow out of experiences contrasting with our own. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you very much, Tom. What an interesting, inspirational, a very practical session. Um, thank you for presenting that. And now You're welcome. We, we have time to move over to some of the questions which have been coming in. And so thanks to all those who posted questions um, to, to, to this point. Um, the first question I'm going to pick up on is, um, we have one that actually was in the chat box, which I'm going to bring across to, so that I remember it is, about research skills. Um, do you have some suggestions around resources that you that you would recommend the students to use to engage in the research skills side of um, what you were presenting? Adrian, would you mind picking up on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think the, uh, the, 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 the first point was um, outlined um, in the cycle that we're proposing is that the, the first point of reference in terms of research is the community that your school finds itself in, going out, having a look, and um, looking at the community, talking to your learners about their lived experience within that com community, bringing in different perspectives, older people, um, uh, uh, 
people who work in different capacities in, in that community? What are the needs of that community? How well are they being met? What are the issues? How could they be different? All of these can be can be done in the in the first um, case by first hand um, primary research and reflection on that. Um, I would also say not to neglect collaborative work with international colleagues. It may be like this in our context. What's it like in a different context? Are is there any lessons that they have learned that might be appropriate to ours? Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, I've got another question, a couple of questions around dealing with um, dealing with different perspectives around religion or potentially values and taboos. Um, so I'm going to collect those questions together. Um, we have one question. I've often encountered religious perspective narrated by students, their belief and conditioning and how it shapes their views. What's your opinion about this? And relatedly, there's a question around some cultures having different values and also taboos. Um, these are important for thinking globally and acting, aren't they? So maybe Tom, if you would mind picking up on this idea around dealing with religious perspectives, um, possibly traditional values within these kind of lessons? I'll certainly try. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think we have to allow other perspectives, uh, really without compromising the, the whole sort of uh, basis for, for global perspectives as a, a curriculum. Um, we need to hear different voices and we need to accept that there are diverse perspectives on any particular issue. Um, I think it is very tricky though, when you're talking particularly about the, the religious perspective, um, which may be associated with um, some quite powerful authorities within society. Uh, all I can say there is that I think, you know, if, if we start doing this kind of work at primary level, um, encouraging learners to talk about their personal perspectives on things um, and then drawing in wider local or national perspectives, Perhaps we do open up um, more of a, a, a field for different perspectives to be taken into consideration. Um, I, I really can't stress, though, that I think this needs to be handled very sensitively at a local level. Um, and there may be some, some issues, some topics that uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to address in particular localities, um, which is why I think you know, it, it was important today to try and offer a more flexible approach um, one that could be applied to any local issue uh, that is of importance to the learners um, and which therefore will be more, uh, more acceptable within a particular context. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'm going to pick up another question around um, younger learners. Um, the question is, is it more difficult for younger students to do this type of practice? And I guess linked to that, what suggestions, recommendations could you make for bringing the younger students into these activities and helping them to engage with these activities. Adrian, if you wouldn't mind picking up on that one, and perhaps stop sharing your screen so we can yeah. see you more clearly. Awesome, okay, yeah, uh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I think we saw, saw some interesting examples in the two that we showed, just um, how um, a six-year-old responds to it and, an, uh, uh, and a nine-year-old. Um, I think that, you know, that the, the, the work clearly in Oscars, um, he, he'd come to a consciousness of a, a range of international uh, connections, uh, notably that the, um, the, 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 the football team that he, he, he supports, which is, is, is local in North London, uh, is uh, staffed by a, 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 a veritable United Nations of players. Um, start with the, with the with the young, younger learners um, as with the older ones. Let's start start with the, with the, with the co concrete. I think if if you just um, have a look at the um, labels inside your gar in the garments that you wear, wh where does that come from? It's just one example of how, how that we could we could look at our connections um, across the world. Let's uh, ne next time you get the shopping, let's have a look at the labels on the produce and on the tins. Where was that grown? Where was it made? Can we grow that here? If so, uh, why 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 aren't we we, we using that issues opening themselves? I don't see obstacles to exploring that. 
uh, with younger learners, of course, the level of scaffolding required will be greater. Um, it will require longer for them to move to um, independence. But there's no reason why these issues shouldn't be approached with, uh, with actually very young learners. Thank you, Adrian. Um, perhaps a related question to some of the themes you picked up there. How can, and this is to Tom, how can global themes be localised to make learners easily understand? So I guess Tom's, uh, Adrian's already touched on that, but Tom, perhaps you could add specifically on that point around localising those global issues for the... For the, the yeah, and, and again, that, that's quite a tricky issue. Um, I mean, curiously, some teachers, some global perspectives teachers do report that it's more difficult in some ways to access local perspectives uh, than it is to access global perspectives, if you're, particularly if you're working online a lot. Um, it, it tends to be the global that uh, is perhaps more easily accessed, particularly if you're, you're expecting to do everything in English. Um, I would, again, though, I, I think, come back to Adrian's point, we, if you really want to, to get learners engaged and started on this, I would put the stress on the local, the personal and the local before the global at primary level, at least if you're starting out with teaching global perspectives for the first time. Um, I think that will encourage more uh, opportunities for collaborative work of the type that we've described in, in the research cycle. Um, and it will make it a lot more concrete for the learners. Um, by all means, then make those connections to global issues. Um, but I think what does then arise is, is perhaps uh, the issue of the, the learners' uh, language skills and so on. To, to access those, those resources uh, may be quite challenging, may be quite demanding for them at this stage, um, which is again why we've, we've put such an emphasis on carrying out primary research, which we believe is, is something that makes um, the whole business more accessible to learners. Can I pick, pick, pick up on that, that one? Because I, I, I think that I mean, starting with where your learners are is, is abs absolutely part of it. Sometimes, of course, your learners experience, I'm thinking of when I started teaching, uh, where the learners um, I taught were primarily of Pakistani heritage and who understood, understood very well the local context, the area in which they lived. They also understood very well a comparative international context because uh, very many of them had actually been to visit relatives in Pakistan. Their understanding of the national context was perhaps more hazy uh, than the, their understanding of places that they had visited in Pakistan. So I mean, that would be a, an appropriate progression from the local to their international perspective through the visits that they've made, then to the national. Well, what are the similarities? What are the differences about these places? What, uh, how are the issues played out in similar or different ways? But some, some issues, for example, we could talk about traffic congestion, pollution, noise, um, difficulties for getting a, 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 from, from A to B, um, housing needs. O all of these are uni universal needs um, and the issues play themselves out differently in different contexts. Thank you, Adrian. We, we, we're running out of time, so a really quick answer to what's potentially a big question. How can we effectively implement these strategies in our online classrooms, given COVID? <laughs> Uh, first of all, acknowledge that, the, that, that there will be limitations. Look at the separate webinar that I know is available on this very issue. Stay safe. Work within robust e-learning safeguarding frameworks and policies. The pandemic is, of course, a global issue, and it's got different local consequences. It has shaped our learners' lives, so it's a legitimate focus for study. Be sensitive. Their well-being may be, have been impacted. Uh, in ways we don't know. So let's establish some ground rules for discussion and make sure that you look at school policies on their well-being. Thank you very much. Well, that's, I'm afraid, all we have time for today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you for all of your questions and apologies if we didn't get around to answering yours. Thank you also to Tom and Adrian for taking the time to be with us today. As we said earlier, we will be uploading a recording of the session to YouTube 
so you'll be able to revisit the webinar and share with colleagues. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you again for joining us.